we took a vote earlier as people were gathering, and we decided that you only get, there's only one snow that comes in the spring, and we decided that this is it. So that's the good news, right? What we're going to do is we're gonna, I'm going to invite you to please look and see when you can help usher in this service. This book is empty. We need folks to, to fill it and fill it up. Uh, and time. So if you would look at your schedule, I'll pass it around. When it gets to the back, we'll pass it the other way. I'll start here. And if you would pass the, pass the book around as we go. We are glad that you are here with us at worship tonight. A couple of things we definitely want to lift before you. This Wednesday is a very special day as we continue with our our lunches and dinners. This Wednesday at lunch, we're going to have our regular lunch church. But for dinner, we are having a special guest that we are bringing in from Israel who is coming to lead a Seder tasting. If you haven't signed up already, please, please sign up. We need to know how many people, the dinner church part, you know, that's normally whoever can come, and if you can sign up thinking you're coming or not, and you do, that doesn't matter. We need to know how many are going to come so that we have all of the right kind of uh, sacramental foods for the Seder. And this person is, is a Jewish person who believes in the Messiah, okay? And so they're going to share uh, from a true historical uh, Jewish perspective Please, please plan to come and let us represent our church well. The, this will happen at 6 o'clock on Wednesday. If you can join us or would like to join us, make sure you sign up on the iWorship today. A couple of other announcements. Uh, VBS, we are looking for volunteers. And here is the reality. Pastor Carrie is so nice. She lays things out in such a wonderful, positive way. I am not, as you all know. So I'm going to speak the truth. Here's the deal. If we don't come up with 13 people willing to help lead VBS by Palm Sunday, then we are not having VBS this year, and that would be a tragedy. We now have six. We need seven more people who are willing to help with VBS. So I'm just going to lay it out there like it is. Pastor Kerry will encourage you and all of that. I'm just going to speak straight at you, okay? And so here it is, and that's, and, and that's the honest truth. And we are having a VBS that is planned to be outdoors this year, and we have various spots outdoors that we're planning to use. There's not a lot of decorations like other VBSs. Uh, it, the, the, the only thing that will be inside will be the snacks. So if you are able to help and have that week in June, June 6 to 10 available to give to helping. We need a core of 13 key volunteers and then some others, but we need to have that core together by Palm Sunday. Okay? Wouldn't it be a tragedy if we didn't have it? Okay, so that's the reality. Want to lift up also Food Pack on April 2nd? And uh, that's at 9.30 to 11.30. We have historically done wonderfully with this. It's a great opportunity for service uh, for school and other things. And so we invite you to plan to be a part of it. Please sign up if you're going to participate in that. Now, I'm going to just congratulate everybody. Okay? So I've already spoken straight at you. Here comes the good news. Turn to the next slide. We have raised in really... Two and a half weeks, because the first week we, it, we, we, we announced it, but we didn't put it in the bulletin. Aid for Ukraine and the horrible, horrible situation in Ukraine. And we have raised as a church already, how much? $9,000. Notice the thermometer is not all the way to the top. Okay? If you want to join us in this and you're looking for a way to do so, please join us. We're using World... Uh, Lutheran World Relief. Lutheran World Relief is supported by the ELCA for the administration dollars. Any dollars that come uh, and are given for, for to Ukraine, a hundred percent. That's higher than the Red Cross and many other out there will go to Ukraine. So here's a great way to help in that uh, horrible situation 
Um, and again, our prayers are with the folks uh, of Ukraine and the whole, that whole region of our world. So we want to lift that to your attention. Okay, here comes the good news. Let us stand for the passing of the peace. Peace of the Lord be with you. Let us share the peace by waving to our neighbors and saying peace, 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 peace. forgiven because you were forsaken unaccepted you were condemned I'm alive and well your spirit is within me because you died and rose again I'm forgiven because you were forsaken I'm accepted, you were condemned. I'm alive and well, your spirit is within me, because you died and rose again. Amazing love, how can it be that you, my King, would die for me? Amazing love, I know it's true, it's my joy to honor you. Amazing love, how can it be that you, my King, would die for me? Amazing love, I know it's true. And it's my joy to honor you in all I do. I honor you. You are my king. You are my king. Jesus, you. you are my king. Amazing love, how can it be that you, my king, would die for me? Amazing love, I know it's true. It is my joy to honor you. to worship based on Psalm 32. Count yourself lucky how happy you must be. You get a fresh start. Your slate's wiped clean. God holds nothing against you and you're holding nothing back from him. When I kept it all inside, my bones turned to powder. My words became day-long groans. Then I let it all out. I said, I'll make a clean breast of my failures to God. We worship you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Let us sing our hymn of praise. Your grace is enough. Great is your faithfulness, O God of Jacob. You wrestle with the sinner's restless heart. You lead me by still waters into mercy. 
see Where nothing can keep us apart So remember your people Remember your children Remember your promise, O oh God For your grace is enough Yeah, your grace is enough Yeah, your grace is enough Yeah, your grace is enough for me Great is your love and justice, God of Jacob You use the weak to lead the strong you lead us in the song of heaven's victory and all your people sing along so remember your people remember your children us all with your mercy by your baptism clothed with garments of your grace and feed us at the table of your love through Jesus Christ our Savior and Lord who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit one God now and forever amen please be seated The first reading is from Joshua chapter 5. The Lord said to Joshua, Today I have rolled away from you the disgrace of Egypt, and so that place is called Gilgal to this day. While the Israelites were camped in Gilgal, they kept the Passover in the evening on the 14th day of the month in the plains of Jericho. On the day after the Passover, on that very day, they ate the produce of the land, unleavened cakes and parched grain. The manna ceased on the day they ate the produce of the land, and the Israelites no longer had manna. They ate the crops of the land of Canaan that year. The word of the Lord. The second reading is from 2 Corinthians chapter 5. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view. Even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, we know him no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their tres trespasses against them, and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors for Christ. Since God is making his appeal through us, we entreat you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, 
so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. The word of the Lord. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. Nothing in all creation can separate us from the love of God. Luke's Gospel, the 15th chapter. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So Jesus told them a parable. There was a man who had two sons. The younger of the, them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. So he divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all that he had and traveled to a distant country. There he squandered his property in desert loot living. When he had spent everything, a famine overtook the place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him to the fields to feed the pigs. He would have gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough to spare, but here I am dying of hunger. I will get up and go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. And then the father said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, and before you I am no longer worthy to be called your son. The father said to his slaves, Quickly, quickly, bring my ro out the right robe, up the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet, and get the fatted calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is now alive. He was lost and is found. They began to celebrate. Now his elder son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard the music and dancing, and he called one of the slaves, asking what was going on. And he replied, Well, your brother has come, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he got him back safe and sound. Then the older brother became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him. But he answered his father, Listen, for all of these years I have been working like a slave for you and I have never disobeyed your command, yet you have never given me even a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when his son, uh, this son of yours comes back who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. And the father said to him, Son, you are always with me. All that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. The gospel of our Lord. Please be seated. Just a few moments ago. We heard one of the favorite of all favorites of Jesus' parables, right? It should be noted that it only appears in Luke's gospel. It's a story full of passion and intrigue and dysfunctional family dynamics with an amazing, astounding conclusion. Over the years as a preacher on this text, Striving to share the truths of the gospel as the preacher, I have, I have asked the question, where do you find yourself in this story? Are you the son who selfishly asked for your inheritance before dad dies and goes to squander it on decadent living? Or are you the son who is 
steadfast in working a, the, uh, their part in the family farm. And when he hears that the wayward son has returned and been granted a once in a decade type of party, your feelings get all up in a knot and feel cheated from what feels to be rightfully yours. Today, I would like to focus on the father. As Jesus tells this parable, the father is to represent our heavenly father and thus reveals some awe-filled and amazing realities about who God is. As stated, the parable begins with the son holding out his hand, demanding, not asking, that he get his share of the inheritance right now, up front. A kid with his hand out is, isn't an unusual picture, if you've had children, as any parent knows. But in this case, it is particularly a shocking one, given the cultural conventions of that time because you see Jewish law dictated that when a father passed away the eldest son would get two-thirds of the estate a double portion and the next son would get one-third but as Jesus tells it dad is still alive and well and so the younger son commits an egregious offense by basically asking pop I wish you were already dead Forget the family business, and for, for that matter, the whole family. Give me my part. I'm out of here. And after he offends his loving father, this suddenly wealthy kid begins to live it all up in a foreign Gentile country. There he squanders all the property by living in a wild and undisciplined lifestyle. But after he's blown it all and is now flat broke, he hires himself out to a Gentile pig farmer, which is about as un-Jewish as you can get. Pigs were an abomination to Jews, and people who cared for swine were to be cursed and were cursed to do so. And so the picture of this young man, hungry and destitute, sitting in the filthy filth of a pigsty, envying the slop of pigs themselves, would be qualify would qualify this man to be seen as below the depths of any dignity. Choose your own English word for that. But in the midst of this pigsty, the ditch of life, if you will he also experiences a revelation. Just as Lutherans found that the theology of the cross, it is often in life's darkest and most difficult moments that we cry out to God, and that it's also in that mo those moments that we realize how close God has been, closer than we could have ever imagined. And so in the midst of the piles of pig poo, this boy came to himself, as our English translation has it, and decides to go home. This coming to himself, as the gospel puts it, is, a mo is an astound astounding moment of awareness that he had messed up, that he had taken a wrong path that he was in a world of hurt. And it is in this moment of true reckoning that a metanoia moment occurs. Metanoia. Metanoia is a Greek word meaning repentance, which literally means to turn 180 degrees and go back God's way. Maybe you have had one or several of those moments in your lifetime, metanoia moments. I know I have many times. It's the beginning of trying to get back on the road to life and healing and renewal and back into God's presence. Thank God this, this wayward one came to himself and began the process of repenting and realizing 
his return home was far better than freedom in a far off country. So the prodigal kind of reminds me of a story about a kite that was flying um, and the kite began to talk to itself. The kite said, if only I could get rid of this string. If the string wasn't holding me back, then I could really soar. I could fly above the clouds. I could fly as high as I would want to fly. If I could get rid of this string, there would be nothing holding me back. I'm limited by this string and one day the kite got its wish, and the string broke, and the kite came crashing down. What the kite did not realize was that the same string that kept it up, or kept it down, kept it up, right? Cutting the string did not make it any freer prodigal realized in the pig pen that when he cut the string of dependence upon God in search for more pleasure, the same string that seems to hold you down always keeps you flying high. God wants us to trust him. Staying connected to God keeps us from falling. And so just as he had left the father in the beginning of the story, now he leaves everything else behind to go back home, and he leaves that far-off country. Now as he travels, I imagine he, he is formulating this bright, new, brilliant plan of his own to fake out a quasi-life for himself, a life as a hired hand. At this point, it's obvious that he thought his sonship was lost. But that there is a possibility that maybe, maybe the old man was senile enough to make a deal. I can imagine that as this prodigal was traveling back to his father's house, the closer he got to familiar territory, the pace slowed down so even to a point where he would hesitate, wrestling with the reality of living out this plan of his. He wondered if he was making the right decision. He wondered how his, his resolve would be to become his father's servant and how that sounded from his dad's perspective. And as he got closer and closer, he could see the father's house from a distance and his heart heart was pounding and his hands were sweating profusely. The Bible tells us that the father simply just sees a corpse of a son coming down the road and even with nearsighted vision saw the glimpse of a son and although he didn't see the full image of him approaching, he knew by his walk that he was his son. And then the parable tells us the father is God, right, ran to meet his son. And because of this, on this fourth weekend in Lent, I am glad to say that the father ran because it informs us that God is willing to meet the prodigal, us, right where we are in life. Now, I don't know if you noticed the picture. Can you see the little, the father running you got to look to see it. It's right under the words, put his. The father had the burden of sin and guilt upon him, and the load was so heavy for him to carry. But the father shows us that it is these times that God is willing to come to meet us in the, our situations of despair. This is what the theology of the cross is really all about. God meets us in our darkest moments when we think we least deserve it. We witness God running to meet the prodigal in the midst of this sweaty hands, lump in the throat, begging for life kind of moment. And God not only meets us, but God runs to us. God is our hope for the hopeless. God is our strength when we are weak. 
the day God ran speaks to who God is. It reshapes an image of a God who some think is cold or calculating or difficult or demanding or ruthless or a killjoy to a God that sees all, knows all, is everywhere, can do anything, and is a God who responds to our most infinite need. We do not have to reach a certain point or level or place to encounter God, for God meets us right where we are. The prodigal, groveling here, ready to give up his sonship, his princehood, if you will, in order to be a hired hand and on his knees, he says, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in the sight and, I, and in your sight and I am no, no longer worthy to be called your son. And right here we learn that true confession, true confession involves not just an admission of guilt, an admission that we messed up, an acknowledgement of our fault. But confession is a true dying moment. We die to ourself. Let me quote Robert Father uh, Farrar Capon on, on regards to the nature of confession. He writes, confession is not a medicine leading to recovery. If we could recover, if we could say that the beginning, the beginning tomorrow or the week after next, we would all be well again, why then all would we need to do, all we would need to do would be to apologize and not confess. But we never recover. We die. And if we live again, it is not because the old parts of life are jiggled back into line, but because without waiting for realignment, some holy other life takes up residence in our death. And grace does, grace does not do things tit for tat. It acts finally and fully from the start, unquote. Now, of course, the father did not ask him to earn his forgiveness, to earn it, because no amount of good works can save us from our sin. This should be our posture throughout this Lenten season, as Psalm, 1, as Psalm 51 1 tells us and says, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. And so in the far off country, the prodigal learned the meaning of misery, but back home he discovers the meaning of mercy. Every confession a Christian makes bears witness to this because every confession, public or private, specific or general, is made and given subsequent to the one baptism we receive for the forgiveness of sin. We are forgiven in baptism, not only for the sins committed before baptism, but a whole lifetime of sin yet to come. So, the day that God ran also informs us that God is willing to suffer for our sake. For those who are prodigals living in far off countries, he's willing to run to, to greet, to suffer for. Most interpreters of verses 20 and 24 through 24 depict the Father's attitude as that of our Heavenly Father toward sinners in, un, in, in answering the accusation of the scribes and the Pharisees that Jesus addresses at the beginning of the story. I truly believe that the Father, our God, rejoiced in seeing his Son coming back. God, who is rich in mercy and grace, the and great in his love toward us, welcomes us back, but this is made possible because of his sacrifice for us on the cross. Brothers and sisters, now listen to this. In Eastern culture, old men do not run. Maybe in this culture, too. 
And yet the father in this story ran to meet his son. Why? Well, one obvious reason is his love for him and his desire to show that love. But there's something else involved here. This wayward son had brought disgrace upon his family by his actions. And not only his family, but his whole village. I'm sure people talk, right? And according to Deuteronomy 21, 18 to 21, this means that if the son ever returned, he was to be stoned to death. If the neighbors had started to stone the son, they would have hit the father who was running to embrace him. What a picture of the lengths to which this father's love goes to reveal the love he had for the prodigal and for us, risking his own body to the threat of stoning in order to save his wayward son. You know, the day that God ran really reveals how wide and deep and high and amazing God's love and grace is and so I'm glad on this fourth weekend in Lent that, that God ran to meet us. All of humanity sinking in the despair of guilt and shame straight from the pig pens of life. Our Heavenly Father restores us in meeting us where we are through love and in sacrifice. And it shows the kind of celebration that God has when wayward sinners come home by changing their clothing from rags to the finest robes with family rings on their fingers. You see, the main point of this parable is to remind us all of the embracing lengths to which God goes in the person of our Lord Jesus, even running to meet the prodigal son to make that homecoming So what is Jesus calling us to in keeping with our Lenten theme, right? Well, our challenge is to be like that father who ran, who opened his arms to the lost, those who are bullied, those who are oppressed by the powerful, those who are discriminated against for their sexual orientation, those who are hurting or broken or lost, those who are seekers or even doubters of the faith. It is the mission of the church to open its doors to all the lost souls in this life. In fact, just opening the doors, really, it's not enough. The God who runs to meet our needs teaches us that we must be willing to race out to the sidewalk, into the neighborhoods, and up to the closed doors, proclaiming the promise of forgiveness and God's love and extending embraces of welcome and acceptance. Like the waiting father in this week's parable, the church filled with Christ's love and Christ's grace just can't sit still and wait for the slow, hesitant approach of lost ones. And like the prodigal son's father, it is our mission and our mandate to jump with joy at the sight of lost stragglers journeying slowly in our direction to help them get a picture that in Christ, their failure and brokenness isn't final and isn't failed. Let us stand as we continue with confession and forgiveness. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Remembering that we have a gracious God who runs to us, who desires relationship with us so much that he sent his only Son, Jesus, to die for us. We draw close to confess our sin and brokenness. For the things we have done that we regret. For the things we have failed to do that we regret. Forgive us. For all the times we have acted without love. 
forgive us for all the times we have reacted without a thought. Forgive us for all the times we have withdrawn care. Forgive us for all the times we have failed to forgive. Forgive us for hurtful words said and helpful words unsaid or finished tasks and unfulfilled hopes. God of all time, forgive us and help us to lay down our burden of regret. God, who is merciful and kind, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, hears the cries of all who plead for mercy. And in these last days has sent Christ Jesus to announce the good news of forgiveness to all who are bound by guilt or broken by shame, that they might praise God and serve the world with glad and generous hearts. For freedom, Christ has set you free. Thanks be to God. Let us sing. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. T'was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace Chains are broken, I've been set free. My God, my Savior, has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy reigns. Unending love, amazing grace. Drawn close to the heart of God, 
we offer these prayers for the church, the world, and all who are in need. Please be seated. Jesus formed the disciples in the ways of extravagant mercy and profound welcome. Lead your church to be a community marked by forgiveness, hospitality, and celebration. Send us to transform a world plagued by fear and condemnation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You make the land to produce a harvest that sustains your entire creation. Equip farmers and farm workers who till the soil. Nourish the earth with ample rainfall and abundant sunshine. Heal grounds tainted by pollution and misuse. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Countries are divided, and leaders often harbor grudges. Reconcile nations that experience conflict. Act quickly to bring an end to war. Anoint peacemakers trained in the art of diplomacy and foster a spirit of collaboration among political rivals. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Your people cry for help in times of distress. Resolve disagreements among family members. Save those experiencing financial hardship. Hear our prayers for those who are sick or grieving. Console us with the promise that everything can become new. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Your love comes to us when a table is set and a feast is prepared. Bless the feeding ministries of this congregation. Bring an end to hunger in our community and around the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. The one who was dead is alive again. We give thanks for those who have died, confident that steadfast love surrounds them. Shelter them in your love until we are gathered at your heavenly banquet. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our church family and those we name aloud or silently in our hearts that all experience the healing and comfort given through Christ. Lord, in your mercy, into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy, through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. The night in which our Lord Jesus was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks. He broke it and he gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup and he gave thanks and he gave for all to drink saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. In a moment, the assisting ministers will come forward. We'll invite you to head out the side aisle to go into the sacristy. There is a sanitizer there uh, to, if you, you wish to use it. We invite you then to space yourselves appropriately and come forward to receive communion. We want to remind you to please remember your uh, I Worship Today card and your offering. You may go.
that one. There's this one here. I don't know if you might have asked this before. I'll be in the middle. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the gift of his body and blood strength and keep and unite us now and forever. Amen. And now may God who has called us forth from the dust of the earth and claimed us as children of the light strengthen you on your journey to renewed life. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine upon you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. Go in peace, serve the Lord.